Hello everybody, my name is Javi Mendoza and we are so excited that you are here with us today. Here are some upcoming events that you may want to know about. Going on a short-term mission provides individuals a chance to see what God is doing in another culture while serving and loving others. Participating in one also transformed the way people live their lives when they come back home. Our final two short-term missions of 2019 are coming up soon. We will have a Wilmington Immersion Mission that will shed light on the needs in our community on June 27th through 30th, as well as a team heading to Richmond, Virginia on July 11th through 14th. The deadline to sign up is May 25th and is quickly approaching. Visit pc3wilmington.org slash short-term missions for more details. If you have any questions about our upcoming events or want to sign up, you can stop by the gallery and talk to one of the volunteers today. Thank you so much for being here today. We're so glad you chose to spend your Sunday with us. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? Come on, can we stand to our feet? We're really excited you guys are here this morning. We get to celebrate baptism in a few minutes, so we are really excited about that, just to celebrate God's faithfulness, that he is working in our waiting, and that we get to hear a story of faith and believing in Jesus. So we're gonna celebrate that in a few minutes, but right now we're just gonna raise our voices in worship and sing and declare these truths over our life, that God is faithful and that he is always good to us. So if you need to, would you sit your coffee down so you can raise your hands and maybe you can just sing these words and believe them this morning, that he is with us and that he is good. Let's sing together. People come together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is one children of generations of every nation of kingdom come so don't let your heart be troubled hold your head up i don't feel no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you So take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where our help comes from
Cool, with all you got, would you sing it out? Swing wide. Swing wide. Oh, you heavens, let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All the children, clean hands, feel hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. A swing wide, all you heavens.
God, we declare today that you're good. We sing those truths, we sing those promises as one body, one voice, as your people, declaring that you're king, declaring that our lives come up underneath your promises and your provision and your son, Jesus. We thank you for these moments to declare as one body that you are king. Thank you for this time. Amen. Thanks so much for singing with us. You guys can have a seat. We get to continue our worship today um, through baptism. We get to be a part of Zachary's family. We get to be a part of the church celebrating his next step in his relationship with the Lord. We get to be a part of his celebration. So I invite you to take a look at Zachary's story. My parents had always told me there was a God and I knew the story of Jesus Christ, but I didn't really know what the reason was and why I needed Christ and why, I guess as a young person, real young, uh, you haven't had a lot of trials yet and you don't know how much you need um, Jesus. So in high school, I wasn't the best kid. I went through some struggles and things like that, and uh, my mom uh, and dad, they encouraged me, uh, basically forced me to go to a Christian school, and I kind of fought it. Uh, once I was there as a gentleman, uh, he ran the school. Uh, he was very influential in my life, started to show me the way, started to show me how to connect with God, really gave me uh, that relationship that I didn't know I needed. I got to know who God and, and Jesus Christ were um, and are. And it was, it was a great experience. And after that, I grew, you know, my faith grew. Um, then I came to college. Um, started doing some of the old habits, doing some of the old things, um, and not putting him first. After I graduated from Cape Fear, was out probably doing some things I shouldn't have been with some friends, and I injured my back put a lot of effort and energy into kind of fighting and clawing my way back. I was like tempted to say, look what I did. Um, look, I, I came back from this horrible injury. I came back from almost not walking. And now I know it was God. I know that terrible event was God. Um, that, was, that was there to change me because after that event, a lot of things changed and you know, I met my wife, my son came along and God redirected my past and I can see that now. And I can, when I pray and when I think and reflect, I know that was God. I remember, I was by myself, I was home, uh, my son was napping, and I was watching a sermon online, and I remember just kind of putting the phone down and s just praying that I wanted Jesus to come into my heart, and, you know, I'm so sorry for all of my sins, and, you know, I want to be forgiven, and I know He's the only one that can do that, um, and I want to live my life for you. I remember that day I felt so relieved and so happy that I had a new purpose and a new new way to live. Um, and I had somebody new on my side that I hadn't been hanging out with very much and I haven't been talking to very much, but I knew he was loyal and I knew he was here for me. And all I had to do was ask. I think I'm a better father, um, better husband, a better friend. There's things I would never be doing before that I do now. I work a day a week at a ministry um, out in Carolina Beach, um, help them out. It's a children's ministry. It's been great. It's been a blessing. I never ever imagined I would be uh, working with kids um, in a you know, Christian-based youth center, but it's uh, it's been amazing. Um, and that's that's God. That's that's not me. That's God changing my heart. I want to be baptized because you know it's the next step in my faith. Um, it's a public declaration of my faith in Jesus Christ and that He died for my sins and and hung that on the cross for me and for everybody else. Well, Zachary, uh, thank you 
for sharing your story with us today. And I know that the process of getting to this day and, and doing all this and kind of laying it all out there in front of everyone, it, it can be nerve wracking and I get that. Um, but what's pretty cool is your story is probably not that far off from so many others that are in this room. And you know, what's cool is, is you were once lost, but you were found just like all of us. And it was that transformative moment where you accepted Christ into your life where the, the old died, it, it went away and the new has come. And, and what I love about your story and about so many other stories that are even in this room right now is, is I look at them as being these little tiles in this mosaic picture that God is building. And no matter how crazy um, or how chaotic or even the things that don't make sense in this, in this journey that God has us on, ultimately in the end, God is putting those pieces together to paint this picture that is far greater than anything we could ever imagine. And the power that He has given you in your story, it is the most powerful, the greatest tool that He could have given anyone to be able to tell this story to someone in your own words, in your own way that can point someone to Christ. And that's the power of the work that, that Christ accomplished on that cross to bring love into a world that so desperately needs it. And He has called you into that same narrative, into that same story to spread that same good news that you have accepted in your life. So it is today that I'm honored to be able to stand next to you and to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Plug your nose. There you go, buddy.
truth When I see that cross I see freedom When I see that grave I'll see Jesus And from death to life I'll sing your praise In the wonder of your grace When I see that cross I see freedom See that grave, I'll see Jesus. From death to life, I'll see. Come on, church, we can do better than that this morning. Let's go. That is so, so good. I really believe that you in this room, as well as myself, really needed to not only hear that this morning, but to declare that over our lives. Because I believe firmly deep within inside of me that there is a God in the universe that is madly in love with us and He came to change our story. He came to change our lives and we have access to that life this morning. Let's celebrate, church. It's good. It's really, really good. You can have a seat. Thank you for worshiping and declaring truth uh, over the life of our church and over our family this morning. Thank you, Zachary. For, for being bold and standing up and sharing your story and sharing what God is doing in your life. It really is such a powerful statement of what God is doing in our church and what God is doing in our world. And I love baptism for so many different reasons, but uh, chief among them is it represents this, this pivot, if you will, from you're doing life focused over here and then all of a sudden you, you have an encounter with God, you have an encounter in what God's asking you to do and you just literally shift your perspective and all of your life begins to change because you begin to be focused on the fact that God is in love with you and there's nothing that you have done, there's nothing that you can do to change that fact. He will always and forever will be in love with you and that is something for us to hold on to and for us to live from. 
And today is no different. I want to encourage us as we sing and as we give and as we learn and as we listen to maybe have that same pivot, to go from focused on a life right here that it's all about us and about the chaos and the darkness of this world to literally just, just to shift our perspective to the God who is in love with us. So today we're in week uh, four of a series called With, where we've been talking about this idea that we actually get to do life with God. So as the host team comes down to receive our offering, I would encourage you to do that same motion, to maybe pivot your perspective in the way that you view your finances and the way that you partner with the church and maybe give today. And then you can turn your attention to the screens, to the first chapter in the book of John in the New Testament, where John records uh, this idea that we have grace upon grace and all of that comes from a guy named Jesus. Good morning. I am very, 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 very glad to be here with you today. Uh, if you were here last week, you'll know exactly why I'm so glad to be here today, because I was not here last week. Uh, our other campuses have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, last, because they couldn't, they couldn't tell. Uh, last Saturday, um, I wasn't feeling so well and things weren't working quite right. I'll just leave it there. And I uh, thought I could be okay by Sunday morning, came in here Sunday morning, and we, uh, uh, all the guys were so great to got, a, a, uh, got to preach a message with nobody in here to get one um, recorded. And then I went back and stopped working well again, went back to bed. And so y'all got to see the video last week, which I'm very grateful that y'all did that and everybody got to participate along. But I'm feeling much better. Everybody was texting me and asked me, thought I'd died or something. I didn't die, I was just not working right. <laughs> And um, so I'm much better uh, today and I appreciate everybody uh, calling and asking and texting and commenting on and uh, everywhere about it. So I'm, I'm good and I appreciate that from last week. Um, we are wrapping up this series called With Today. And um, I'm, I'm really excited about this series because it's something we've not really done uh, like this before. And if you have been uh, around Port City, you know our mission is to reach people and help them walk with God. And we've, we've often focused on reach or help or walk, and we've just really wanted to spend some time thinking about this preposition, this, this idea of being with God, what it means to be with God. A lot of times in church world or just in terms of what's expected of people who come to church, 
um, the, the perspective is kind of all over the map. You know, it's like to reach people and help them attend church so our numbers will grow or reach people and help them, you know, attend church so they'll give money to the church and support all of its programs. And, and all those things are, are a part of it. Or, well, they're, they're, they're not really, they are a part of it, but it's to reach people and help them walk with God. Because as you walk with God, you become who it is that you have been created and called to become. And then as you walk with God with us together, we become what it is that he intends for us to become. Um, one of the things that we have to get accustomed to, particularly in this culture that we live in, uh, in the West particularly, but it's just, it's so radically individualistic that most of the, the, the way it talked about you in the Bible was almost never singular personal you. It was always collective, it was always God's people. And for us to start thinking like a community, for us to start thinking like a people, people like us do things like this. That's part of what this is about as we understand what it is that God is calling us to do and more importantly, who he is calling us to become as a church. So my, my, my question or my challenge uh, for today is we're gonna look back through uh, the process we've been talking about over the last uh, few weeks. But the question is this, can can the presence of someone be powerful enough to change everything? Can, can someone's presence, can someone's presence be powerful enough to change what it is that you are experiencing? So we've been looking at this over the last few weeks and, and we've used this idea. If you remember, uh, we talked about the first word is encounter. This is what you see. Uh, the second part of this process is formation. This is what's happening in your heart, who you're becoming, the depths, what's happening in your soul. And then this third part is really what comes out of you. And this is the way you live your life. We call this expression. This is the way in which you become the way you've become. This is the way in which you will become the way you're going to become. This is the process that everybody undergoes. Everybody moves through in terms of how they get to be the way they are. If you do not know what I'm talking about, go back and listen to the last couple of weeks. We've explained this. It's encounter, formation, expression. It's how we become the way that we are. What we see, what we behold, what we encounter, what we collide with, all those things affect who we are on the inside and who we are on the inside always comes out on the outside. That's just the way human beings are, are built or wired. Now, the way a lot of us think when it comes to sort of what's happening in this world, we usually think about a personal growth or personal development, all these things as sort of goals, places in which we need to be. And one of the things we're gonna look at today is this place where Jesus is talking about what happens to us in between two things. When something is occurring and something else is about to occur. And so we're gonna frame it like this, that basically for a lot of us, we sit here where we are and eventually we hope to be there. And if you wanna put this in sort of a time and place continuum, it's here and we sit here now, here and now, and we want to be there sometime in the future or then. I think everybody gets this. And so we sort of have this trajectory. We start to plan our, our lives out on this trajectory to how we're gonna get from here and now to there and then. And what happens is in your mind, what begins to happen is you begin to start getting into the habit of destination thinking. You're sitting here and you wanna be there and you go, okay, when I get there, then I'll feel like this, right? We call this destination thinking because what you believe is if you're sitting here and you're like, when I get a high school, then I'll be happy. And then you think, when I get, when I get out of college, then I'll be happy. And you think, when I get a job, then I'll be happy. And when I get married, did I sorry to say that? Then I'll be happy. And then when I get kids and when I get this and everything becomes about when I get this, then I'll be that. And it's all about moving from one destination to another. And you get to be like 35 or 45 or 55 or whatever it is. And you realize that none of this is working. And you have what's called the midlife crisis. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but it's actually happening earlier and earlier and earlier as the time frame just gets crunched. You're expected to be there far sooner than ever before. The pressure on the next generation is unbelievable when it comes to being where they ought to be in terms of who they ought to be. And there's just no room given for what's supposed to happen along the way. And God has designed this and orchestrated this in a way to, to make something much more uh, different and much more significant and far different than what we think. God has called us in terms of humanity, as human beings, not to just do stuff, but he's called us to be something. 
He's called us to live together, that the idea of being with is more powerful than all the things that we do. There are things that we do that are far more enriched based on who we do them with. And most of us in our pursuit of getting there and then just forget all about who it is that we're with. And so my question to you is there's a way in which someone's presence can actually change the way you experience what you experience. And someone's presence can, ex- can change what you're going through. Because for some of you, you're here is you don't like where you are. You don't like where you are because it's financially hard, because there's some health thing going on, because there's something that you're dealing with that you frankly don't want to deal with anymore. And you keep thinking when you get there, then it will be better. Then this will be gone. This will be behind me and I can move on with my life. Instead of recognizing that all this space in between here and there is actually what your life is. And there's a way that has been made for us to have life, to live life, to experience life all along the ways that we are going in this place that we're going. That's what I wanna explore um, to, to, today. Now, um, last week, uh, Friday, I played golf. Now, for those of you who know me, this is a significant deal, especially knowing my disdain for golf. I don't like golf. I'm a, I'm a pastor, I've been in the ministry for a long time, and everybody thinks the ministers play golf. Not all of them do. Uh, in fact, I don't like it at all. I can't figure out why in the world you wanna be that mad for that long and pay that kind of money to do it. <laughs> like it is, I'm like, you know, and every time I go, people are always trying to give me lessons on the course, which like, that's the one where like, like, I'll play golf, just don't try to correct my slice. And the whole time, all you hear is if you turn your top hand over and open up your stance and like, would you, I don't, I like my slice, please leave my slice alone. You know, and so it's, it's, it's always, so and whenever I go play golf and I got talked into going uh, past, this past Friday, and whenever I go, I figure I can at least look the part. So I don't have a lot of dress clothes on the golf course. You gotta wear slacks or khakis, whatever they call them, and like a polo shirt. So I had on like, I, I pull out the, the, my, the best outfit I can find, at least look like I play golf. Because it's really usually funny. People are like, man, he really looks like he can play golf until they see me swing and it's, wheels off. But I was at lunch after, um, after, the, uh, after our round of golf, I was at lunch and one of the, there were some folks standing there talking and one of the, uh, the guys from the group said, hey, do I know, he's talking to me, he said, do I know you from, uh, uh, from Lockwood Folly Golf Club? Which means I must have like really nailed the look. And I thought, I looked it up and I thought, this is kind of what I look like on that day. I don't know if this is. It's Adam Scott. He's like number two in the PGA right now. I thought I did pretty good. <laughs> I think that's who they mistake me for. <laughs> So that was a win. The other way I keep score is, you can take that down, just you take that down. <laughs> so the other way I keep score is that um, I, I, I usually lose a lot of golf balls. And so I started, my brother gave me, uh, I think I started with three golf balls and I, by the third hole I had lost two, but I had found four. <laughs> I'm like, that's a good down the golf course, right? And so that's the game that I play when I'm out there. And so, Played golf 18 holes, and I'll tell you, Friday I played golf, and Friday was one of the best days of my life. Now you're going, how can that be? How can you do something that you really, really, really don't like to do, and it be the best day of your life? I'll show you how, put the next picture up there. This is me in the middle, in case you couldn't tell. It's not Adam Scott, that's me. Um, My older brother's to the right, my younger brother's in the back, and my dad is to my left. Now, if you remember, this was Friday, so Thursday, uh, May 16th, a year ago, my dad went into the hospital for what they thought was routine back surgery to correct some stenosis, and he'd be back on the road to recovery within just a couple of days, and perhaps just a few weeks, he'd be back to doing a lot of things he had done before. And he went in, had a couple of things or some complications, other things. Turns out within about a week, he was paralyzed from the neck down. That began a year-long struggle with an uh, uh, ailment called Guillain-Barre, which is a, basically an attack on your uh, nervous system. And he wound up uh, pretty much paralyzed from the neck down in the hospital for about 110 days. And this went on and on. It was just a very, very long year for our family as we both had to watch dad um, kind of go through this and to work to help him and all the different things that went on. But he said, one year from that day, I wanna play golf with my boys. And so one year from that day, and one year in a day actually, he played golf with his boys. It was one of the best days of my life that someone's presence, who you are doing something with, 
can change the way you endure something that you may or may not enjoy going through. That's what I want for us to see and be able to experience this in the way that we've been promised and it's been given and made available to us in the world in which we currently live. We left this idea last week because Jesus, and we're gonna look at this in John chapter 14 is where we're gonna be, John 13, 14, 15. Now I've been, um, this, this whole series is kind of inspired from John 17, Jesus' prayer, where he says, my prayer is for all of them who will believe because of the message that my disciples carry into the world. That's us. And he says, I want them to be one. I want them to be with me. And so that I will be in them the way we are in each other, Father. I want there to be this, this union, this, this withness between us. As so we're gonna start in John 13, 14, uh, today, and I always print mine out. That's just how I do it um, because I can like lay it all out um, and read it like a, a, a narrative instead of just pulling out like, like little Twitter feeds. Like, oh, there's a sound bite there and a sound bite there. And I wanna show you why it's so important, particularly in light of what we're gonna be looking at today. The verse that you might be familiar with really comes uh, in, in, a, in the part of a larger uh, thing that's happening that Jesus is talking about. And he's talking specifically about what happens between here and now and then and there. He's telling them, I'm going away. I'm going away somewhere else. I'm, uh, something's about to happen. I'm going somewhere else. I'm gonna come again and get you. But between then, or between here and now and then and there, there's gonna be a way in which you're gonna have to live. And I'm gonna help you with that too. That's what he's telling. That's, the, that's what this whole section is about, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's all about the way things are or not the way things are gonna be. The way you get to where you're supposed to be is gonna require some things to happen. I'm gonna empower you all along. You're gonna have to learn how to think of this completely differently than you're used to thinking about this. And you're gonna see it in the exchanges how radically different this really is. Before we jump in, the reason is because what Jesus promises us, we looked at this last week, if we remain in him, he'll remain in us and we will bear much fruit. It is for the Father's glory. It is his design that you bear much fruit. It is for the Father's glory that you bear much fruit. If you remain in him, you will fulfill and do the thing that you've been created to do. That's a promise. The promise isn't that it'll be easy. The promise isn't it'll look like this. The promise isn't that you'll have more than you'll ever need and, and, and prosperity. The promise is that you will bear fruit that will be to the Father's glory, that your life will count and matter. Everything that happens to you, everything that you participate in will bear, will bring some form that will reveal the Father's work in you and it will be uh, nourishment or it will be offering to the world around you, It'll be good for the world around you. That's what fruit does. Fruit determines the character of who is or what's uh, the tree, the nature of the tree, and it also serves for the good of people around us. That's what the fruit in our lives does. The fruit that comes out of your life is just revelation. It's expression of the Father's glory, of his character, of his heart, joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and the way in which we love other people. This is fruit and it's always offered to the world around us. If you remain in him, that will never be in short supply in your life, ever. Futility will never have a foothold in your life. A lack of purpose will never sort of be the way in which you live if we remain in him. What we said is that you become a disciple of what you remain in. You become a disciple of what you remain in. And the picture is that you become a student of, you become a follower of, you live in the way of the thing that you remain in. What this means is that if you remain in the world, which is what Paul's admonition to us is in Romans chapter 12, right? Do not be conformed into the patterns of this world. You're gonna wake up and everything about what you're gonna experience is gonna squeeze you into a particular direction. If you remain in that pattern, right, you'll become a follower of that pattern. So Jesus invites us into a different way. He says to remain in me, walk with me, be a disciple of me. Learn from me, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added. You'll, he, the Father knows what you need. All this language begins to come to bear. And what he's doing is he's preparing us. How do we get from here and now to then and there? What does the process look like along the way? You see, even for a lot of us, if we're really honest, we think that this idea of when we finally express God's character fully is actually the then and there. That's like the goal. And that's something else. So you're waiting until you become better than you are to do things for God 
or for God to finally be pleased with you or for God to finally, whatever your version of that is. And really the point is that expression happens here and it happens here and it happens here. All along the way, this whole process is always working so that we are bearing his fruit in every moment that he has us in every place that he has us. It's not about when you get a certain way, when you become a certain way, when you're better than you are, then you'll be able to do stuff. It's not about that at all. It's how are you gonna live right where you are? This is exactly what Jesus is driving at. Because all the disciples, I think, have a then and there um, a kind of mindset. Because Jesus has talked about, hey, I'm, I'm coming uh, to be the king. I brought my kingdom. This is actually very radical language because Jesus was in, in first century uh, Jerusalem, which was under Roman rule. And it wasn't like polite Roman rule. It was like mean Roman rule. It was very, I mean, they would, they would kill you in a heartbeat. It was one of the most oppressive regimes in the history of the world. And here's Jesus talking about bringing his kingdom. Now, if you've got someone who can walk on water and heal a bunch of people saying they're gonna bring, them, bring their kingdom, you gotta imagine your mind that Jesus is about to wipe out Rome. That's how you be thinking. It's the same culture. I mean, it's the same thing we'd be thinking. I don't wanna get into that, but you get the idea. It's the same thing. So they thought, oh, when Jesus finally whoops Rome, then this will be happening. And so now Jesus comes along and says, hey, I'm going away. They're like, whoa, 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 where, where are you going? You can't leave us here. And so they have this exchange. Now here's why I wanna read this passage to you. Then I wanna put it in its context because a lot of us have heard John 14, one. A lot of times you may hear it at funerals. It's a very comforting passage. Um, there are, I think, a couple of uh, talk shows that have yanked this passage, but it's not what it means. John 14, it says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. Does anybody recognize this? Have you heard this before? Believe in God, right? Believe also in me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm gonna come back and take you to be with me that you also may be with me where I am. It's with language. And then he says this, so he's, he's given this vision, believe in God, trust in God, you know, just as you, you know, keep doing that. I'm going to prepare a place for you and I would have told you if it were something different. And then in verse four, he says this, you know the way to the place where I am going. This is a really interesting phrase. If you kind of look at it in the original language, what actually, what Jesus actually says is that he doesn't talk about a place. Because we think of like this place is there. We're automatically back to this heaven and hell thing. The place is there. He says, you know the way where I am going. You know the way where I am going. That's what he says. And then a lot of times we just stop there and we talk about the, the person and everything's nice and neat. Do not let your hearts be troubled. There's actually a question that follows this. Thomas pipes up in verse five and he says, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Now, a lot of us read this with a lot of respect, like Thomas is like, Lord, uh, we don't know where you're going, how can we know the way? Have you ever talked to someone who's assumed that you knew things that you didn't know and they get to the end of this and you're like, you don't, I don't know what you're talking about. You're not like, could you please, you're usually frustrated, you're like, we don't even know where you're going. How in the world can we know the way, right? That's what I picture this like. This is Thomas. This is not his first rodeo with this doubting stuff. And when you begin to look at this, what you, this is why you spread it out so you can see that it's actually part of something larger. What this actually is, this is not Jesus giving like sort of like talking points for his disciples and they leave. They're actually in a staff meeting. Jesus has got all of his disciples. Judas has already betrayed him and left. He's already washed their feet. He's been talking about this stuff. And then he starts talking about, I'm going away, I'm going away, I'm going away, I'm going away. And the first question actually comes in chapter 13, verse 36, where Peter, who we all know, he's a little bit brash, he kind of raises his hand first. It's almost like a Q&A with Jesus. It's like they're all sitting there talking, Jesus is telling stuff, and they're gonna just start asking questions, and Jesus is gonna answer them. Verse 36, Simon Peter says, hey, Lord, where are you going? Where are you going? Because they keep going, I'm going away, where are you going? So Jesus replies, where I'm going, you can't go, but you'll follow later. Now, think about this. Because if you read the Bible, like it's sterile and it's biblical and it's, if someone says you can't go there, what's the first thing you say to them? Oh, yes, I can, watch me. Lord, where are you going? Jesus said, where I'm going, you can't go, but you'll follow me later. Peter says, Lord, why can't I follow you? I will lay my life down. See, it sounds 
kind of biblical. But he's basically like, Lord, why do you think I can't follow you? What, what, do you, what do you think? Have you not, I walked on, what do you think I can't follow you? I'm, I'm willing to lay my life down for you. I mean, Peter starts to make his case for why he thinks he can do what Jesus says he can't do. And you begin to see this kind of unfolding. This is, these, are, these are legitimate questions that they're asking. There's so much more to this passage. Then Jesus tells Simon Peter. So Simon Peter says, why can't I follow you? I'm, I'm gonna lay my life down for you. And Jesus says, you really think you're gonna lay your life down? Let me just tell you, by tomorrow morning, you're gonna have denied me three times. Ooh, can you hear them all go, ooh. <laughs> then he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There's a place where I'm going to prepare for you. If this were not so, I would have told you. And he's gonna unfold this whole thing. You begin to see the difference in how this whole thing sort of plays together. And then he goes on. That's when he says, you know the way to where I'm going. And then Thomas says, Lord, we, we, we don't know where you're going, so how do we know the way? You know what Jesus' response to that is? I, I am the way. You do know the way because you know me. He said, I'm going away because what's about to happen is something fundamentally different. There's so much more going on here than we can even get our brains around. Part of the problem that we struggle with as human beings, especially human beings with an ego problem, is that we often think that we know more than we do. So what happens is when we read verses like Ephesians chapter three, where it says, God is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or think or imagine. What we usually do is we sort of tack onto that. He's able to give me more of what I already want than I can imagine I want. Nobody, like, it's so funny. We, 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 we do all these things and we're talking about like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna believe God for a miracle in our, in our church, right? What we mean is we see 4,000 people come. We're gonna see 20,000 people. That's more than we can imagine. And it's just a bigger version of what we already think. And what, what's happening here, what you begin to see, this sort of frustration, this is, by the way, two out of five questions that Jesus gets asked from Peter, Thomas, Philip, and Judas. It's a Q&A they're asking because they don't get what he is saying. They just don't get it. And this is kind of the, the, the larger background, then I've got I've to move on, but the larger background is when God created us in the beginning, he created us to live life with God, that he would be in us and we would be in him, that we would participate and contribute and create along with him. That the work that you do week in and week out with your mind and your heart and your hands, the businesses that you lead, the, the restaurants you run, the, the people you wait on, all these things are your contribution to the world that God has created. That's what we do. We're designed to be like this. It's not, God's not indifferent to it. We're designed to do this with him. That was the original thing. But sin broke that. We spent the last few weeks talking about it. Sin broke that. It fundamentally broke every relationship with everything. It created a separation from what we were intended to do and what we actually had the capacity to do. We were no longer with God. The only, only hope we had was to do things for God in order to be with God. That's the whole old covenant of all the sacrifices. It's let's do things for God, then we can be with God. Jesus comes along, he's the final sacrifice. We now, a way has been made for us to be with God again. I am the way for you to be with God once again. If you keep reading the New Testament, Paul would describe it like this. We now have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's presence is in you and filling you. That's the whole point. And Jesus is going, that's what's about to happen. I'm going away, I'm gonna send someone so that I will be with you in all of these moments, that my presence with you has the power to change everything that you see. So many of us are so frustrated because we think that the journey towards all of this stuff is just like this. It's just like this. But it's not, it looks more like this if you're like me. You're like, oh man, I'm doing good going to church. Woof! I'm doing this. So I was like, whoa, what happened there? Does anybody else's walk with the Lord look like that? And we're like, we look at somebody and go, well, I see them, they look like this because I see their Instagram and I see their, I see all this. They just look like this, it's not, it's like this. 
You think you know something, you're like, dude, I, I know, I'm learning so much and growing. And the next thing you know, you go, I don't know anything. <laughs> That's happened to me about six times as a pastor. I've been a pastor for 10 years and had like a train wreck because I'm like, I don't even know what the gospel is anymore. That's not good to be a pastor, a preacher of the gospel and not know what the gospel is. <laughs> it wasn't because I didn't know anything. It's because what's happened is what I, had no, was what, what I had learned, where I had grown to now had implications forward that I had not yet considered and it scared me. And to step into those things is very difficult because it's a lot easier to go back and just do what you already know. This is what happens to us. This is what I mean when I'm thinking, so what happens, we, we either imagine that God wants to just do a bigger version of what we already know, then we're frustrated with that, or we get just sort of the, the wheels come off. We're like, I don't know anything at all. We sort of vastly, we just give up. We just give up. I mean, one of the things, this is, I'll just, this is really the point, is don't stop short, don't give up, don't give in. There's gonna be points all along this journey. It's gonna be right here, and you're gonna wanna just give up. You're gonna be, I'm done. Some of you are here this morning, that's where you are. You're, you're, you're done. God, you're just done. God hasn't done what you thought he would do. You're just done. And you're pulling back, you're pulling back all the things you've always believed. And maybe he's going, hey, I wanna invite you into a new way of life with me, one that you cannot comprehend. It's not a bigger version of what you've already imagined. It's actually beyond what you can imagine. Have we ever really considered that? That there's something more than the American dream at stake. My prayer has been, God, give me a kingdom dream. Kingdom dreams doesn't have to be big. It's not about, it's not about grand. It's about power. That's what I'm asking, God, show me. It's a scary place to be. A few years ago, um, I decided it was time for me to, to kind of uh, start eating better. I was getting in my 40s and I've been pretty fortunate to be uh, kind of buff like this. <laughs> <laughs> to be skinny, I know, I know, I can't help it. But, but, but at the same time, I was like, I don't want to take it for granted. So I, like, I need to pay attention to what I'm eating. So there was like a big uh, uh, a fad, I guess it's still around, but um, where you just kind of watch, you start eliminating certain things that aren't good for your body. And so it's, it's called Whole30. I don't know if you've heard of this or not. Whole30 is basically, it's like basically a 30-day torture. It's what it is. And what you do is you eliminate everything that's not good for you. It's like sugars and anything that's not whole foods. It's whole 30, right? It's whole, whole foods for 30 days. And it's like, basically you can eat eggs and avocados and that's it, and salads. <laughs> and it's because everything has sugar in it. So I remember I'm thinking, all right, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this, man, whole 30, I'm in. So I like avocados, I like scrambled eggs. So the first day for breakfast is scrambled eggs and avocado. I cut it, you're like, I'm gonna take a picture and put whole 30, right? You're, you're, you know, Cause you're like excited about this. Then it's like the afternoon, you're like some turkey and some more avocado. Uh, and, uh, and then the next day it's like avocado and eggs. And the next day for lunch, it's like turkey and avocado. <laughs> and then it's like grilled chicken salad with nothing on it for, um, and you're eating almonds like out in the wazoo cause it's all you can get. <laughs> and then eventually like, you're not taking Instagram pictures anymore. You're just trying not to kill someone. That's literally what's happening. I remember this is about six days in and I was like locked in. And I'm, I'm in there and I love to snack and I love like cookies and milk snacks and you can't have dairy and you can't certainly have cookies. So I'm looking up whole food snacks and actually my daughter sends me a text with this great snack. You remember ants on a log when you were a kid? It's like celery sticks with almond butter and raisins. So it's like 10 o'clock at night. I am mad. I am, I've I had anger issues when I was a kid. They've been dormant for a long time until I was doing this. They were back. And so I'm at 10 o'clock at night. I, I've never understood cravings. And, just like, and I'm telling you, I was craving. I would have eaten the house if you'd have let me loose. So I go in there. I'm like, I'm going to be good. I'm so mad. And I get these and I go in there and I'm, 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 and the more I spread almond butter on these celery sticks, the madder I get. And so it's like 10, 30 night, I'm sitting there and I'm just like, oh, and I'm just, I'm, and I'm now I'm really worked up. The next night, the next day for lunch, I said, Julie, all I want to do is there's one place, there's a salad that actually fills you up. And so we get there and we pull in the parking lot. So I'm just, that's all I'm getting through the day. I'm like, okay, I'm just, I'm just getting through the day because if I can get to the salad at lunch, I'll, I'll be okay. We pull into the restaurant, it is closed. <laughs> and Julie had to hold me in the car because I'm, like, I'm, going, I'm going in, somebody's gonna die, I'm going in. I was so angry, so angry. 
And, and over, over time, it's, this takes about 12 to 15 days of just trying not to kill another human being. And then all of a sudden, somewhere along the way, about day 28, 29, by day 30, I went about 45 days on this. And you would, you would drink a Coke or take a sip of a Coke. Like, oh, 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 what, what is that? Like, ugh, you just couldn't stand anymore. What you thought you couldn't live without 45 days before, you couldn't hardly stand. You know what was happening? Whenever I'm sitting there, what's happening is your, your body is recognizing that it is so dependent on sugar. And all of a sudden, it is becoming less dependent on sugar. It's actually being stripped of its dependent on, dependence on sugar. And it is actually learning how to depend on things that are actually good for it. Now, I know some of you are nutritionists, you're gonna email me. I don't really care about the dynamics of it. This is just a preacher illustration, so just stay with me here. <laughs> but the, the, the point is that your, your body is being stripped of all the things that it is so used to being dependent on for energy that aren't sustainable or really good. And instead, it's learning how to depend on things that it just hasn't had to depend on ever because you had substitute dependence, right? Does that make sense? So think about this in your walk. How many things do we just get dependent on and we don't even know it? There's so, we think we're dependent on God because things, circumstances are working in our favor. God is so good, this happened and this happened. Look at this, it's more than I can imagine. And what Jesus is saying, and he's, he's wrestled with the disciples, he's, the reason for their questions is because they don't fully get it. What he was coming to do is not to help us get from here to there. He was coming to make sure that his image and his love gets demonstrated in every single moment along the way. The reason we're doing relational disciplines on your phone, I know some of you are having trouble with your apps. I get it. I'm having trouble with my app. It doesn't push notifications. So I just go to the app every day. It's not recognizing my face. There we go. <laughs> and so you go to the app and then you just go down and you click it and it'll pull up. This is the relational discipline for today, right? See, last week, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but one of the relational disciplines was to not be on electronic media for, I believe it was a day or eight hours or something. Some of you go, oh, I forgot. Do you know why you forgot? Because we are so unbelievably dependent on it. The thought of going without it is just foreign to us. And when you take it and you put it somewhere, Every 10 minutes, you're like, whoa, what is going on? It's like somebody has to hold, because you, you just feel it. You feel lost, you feel disconnected, you feel all these things. What about conversations? Like, there, there's so many things we're dependent upon. For some of you, you're dependent on so many familiar things in your relationships that you're not moving anywhere past where you already are. Because there are conversations, there are things you need to discover, there are things that need to happen in your relationship, but you just don't, you don't want to risk upset, so you just talk about what you've always talked about. Remember 20 years ago when we were first married and this happened? You don't have anything new. Have any new dreams about what do you think God wants us to do with what, where we are now? Because we're so dependent upon them. And when you start to sort of strip that dependence, you can expect when you start to put your phone down, when you start to fast, like if you take a, a spiritual fast, when you start to read your, your Bible, you start to do things that are intentionally designed to help you become dependent on something new at the expense of being dependent on what you've always been dependent on, you can expect your body to freak out. You can expect your mind to freak out because it is going through that same process that I did sitting in the, thing, sitting in the slice of life when Julie's holding me back going, don't go in and break the door down. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And that's what happens to us. What we have to do, we have to learn how to see God in new and fresh ways. And I don't mean reinventing him. I mean that what happens between here and there is an unfolding of who he is. It unfolds before us. It happens one step at a time. It happens one moment at a time. God's call on your life is to be faithful in the moment, not to do some big thing for him. What I would say to you is instead of, instead of trying to calculate how you're gonna make a huge difference in the world, maybe what we need to do is stop and ponder how God's presence is gonna make a difference in this moment. And when that starts to happen, guess what will happen to the world? It will be different as well. I mean, this is what happened Friday. Now, mind you, the hole's like over there. <laughs> Splash. <laughs> I turn around and I see my dad. He goes. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and everything changes. Everything changes. When Jesus was saying, I'm going away and I'm sending you the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the comforter, the one who comes along inside, the one who dwells within you. What he was saying that whenever you are experiencing whatever it is you're experiencing, you wanna slam your club or beat your chest or whatever it is you think you wanna do, you look around and you see him going. And it changes everything. Do you realize the promise that is given to us is that if we walk in the spirit, in his presence, in awareness with his power and his spirit within us, you will not gratify all the other crazy desires that make you do everything that you regret. That's not a three-step process. That's a promise to understand that when you sense him in the moment, there's a power in his presence that has the capacity to change everything. So what I hope you'll do is get your phones out and start paying attention to these relational disciplines just enough to get your eyes off of your circumstances and all the other things that perhaps you depend upon in order to allow those things to become less so that our awareness of him becomes more and we begin to seek first the kingdom of God and the vision that he actually has intended your life to be for. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your presence with us that truly has power, that we often neglect or underestimate or a host of other things, sometimes just ignore. Father, what I do ask is that you would reveal to us the things that we are dependent upon. I mean, even as I say that, people's minds are going, uh, maybe this, maybe this. You would speak to us and show us. Father, I ask that you would do that, not so that we can just, not, not to punish us, but to free us to be dependent on the things that are actually gonna sustain the life that you have given us to live. So Father, I just ask you to do that as we learn what it's like to live life with you. And I ask all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus, amen.